Universal Center for Renovation presents Historical Israelites. This is strictly for educational purposes and commentary. A biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. In the title of this episode, Sabians, Yemen, Queen of Sheba, King Solomon, and the End Times. This thumbnail represents Yemen, or a group of people or nation known as Sabians. A small and significant group disrupting world commerce. And Queen of Sheba, or Queen of the Ancient Sabaeans, an ancient people of Yemen. And she's talking to King Solomon about an agreement to keep the merchandise from the Far East safely flowing to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, capital of ancient Israel. Israel, who was in ancient time, the center of world trade and commerce, the middleman, managing and directing world trade and global commerce. He who owns Palestine, Israel, rules the world. The state or the modern nation state of Israel is in conflict with the modern state of Palestine. This conflict centers over the claims and right and history of the ancient Israelites being represented symbolically by this young man sitting on a throne and ruling the world. He who owns Palestine, Israel, rules the world, part five. In part one, I try to demonstrate the history of the ancient world, of the ancient nations after the biblical flood of Noah try to establish a global world trade network where the land of Canaan was at the center of this global trade network. The ancient inhabitants of the land of Canaan used bad laws, bad customs, and bad traditions, and this caused disruption in the world global trade network because the trade network was centered in the land of Canaan. And because of their deeds, their mismanagement, the people the ancient people of the land of Canaan were expelled. We can read about this in the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 12, the Apocrypha, verse 1. For thine incorruptible spirit is in all things. Therefore, chastened thou them little by little offended and wanted them by putting them in remembrance wherein they have offended that leaving their wickedness they may believe in thee O Lord for it was thy will to destroy 
by the hands of our fathers, not only those ancient inhabitants of thy holy land, whom thou hated for doing most odious works of witchcraft and wicked sacrifices, that the land which thou esteemed above all other might receive a worthy colony of God's children. So we can see or read that the children of Israel, they were giving a warning to not mismanage the land and set up bad laws, bad customs, and bad traditions. Else they also would be expelled from the land of Canaan like the ancient Canaanites were. When the Queen of Sheba paid a visit to King Solomon, she noted that he was wise and he would not mismanage his people. Therefore, the global trade network would flow and flourish and grow. And she gave her sign of approval and the trade network from the south, the gates were opened and trade flourished. But today, in the year 2024, the Sabaeans, or the people that lived in the area, the Queen of Sheba, do not give their approval and they seek to close the gates of trade and commerce. Unlike Queen of Sheba, who approved of the wise King Solomon and saw that he would not mismanage the center of global trade and commerce. But let me explain in this video why. We can begin with this news article dated December 16th, 2023. MSC, world's largest container shipping company, halts all Red Sea transit. The Houthis, can I use the word or the name Sabians? The Sabians in Yemen have done the impossible. MSC, the world's largest shipping company, has announced that it will not sail through the Red Sea. They made this decision because other container ships have been stopped and seriously damaged by Houthi Sabians in Yemen. Doing something and doing something at any vessel traveling to or from Israel. Yemen or the Sabians is conducting these uh, forays because Israel is doing something to Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. This is an utterly massive blow to logistics supply lines. This will result in a sudden and very sharp disruption to global supply chains. A spike in inflation is to be immediately expected as goods become scarce from lack of or severely delayed shipment. A previous pandemic had already disrupted 
logistic lines. And many countries are unable to control the rising prices of goods. With MSC announcing on a Saturday, they are not sailing through the Red Sea. They join Maersk, Hapeg Lloyd, CMA, CGM, and others, bringing a full 50% of global container ships off limits for Red Sea travel. You can look at this in many different perspectives, but one is the nations of the world at this point in time don't agree with what's happening in the land of Palestine, Israel. So the Sabaeans or the people of the kingdom of Sheba are highlighting their disapproval of the disruption that's taking place in the land of Canaan. Unlike what Queen of Sheba did, where she pretty much said to Solomon, you're wise. I like what you're doing up here. The world is in good hands. Keep doing what you're doing. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When you or any nation rules the world empire or control the world global trade networks, you are in a position of power and authority over all other people. Your nation might have scientific and technology that's more advanced than all other countries or nations. But the majority of the world still have primitive notions about the realities and philosophical points of views. So if you're on the top or your nations is on the top of the pyramid, they, the nations believe that you are divinely inspired, the spirit of the most high God or the gods dwell within you like you are an avatar of higher powers. That's what you represent. But when you show yourself to be not an avatar of God, but of something evil, the nations will start to push back at you. And that's what we see happening in the world today. They're starting to question the status quo, starting to question the validity of who's in power today and what do they represent, a force of good or a force of evil. So when I'm substituting the word Houthis, or Sabaeans for Houthis, or the ancient kingdom of Yemen, or the ancient kingdom of the Queen of Sheba. Let's do a little historical research. Sabaeans, the Sabaeans or Sabians, were an ancient group of South Arabians. They founded the kingdom of Saba in modern-day Yemen, which is considered to be the biblical land of Sheba and the oldest and most important of the South Arabian kingdoms. 
the Sabean kingdom is listed as existing between the time of 1200 BCE until 275 CE. According to the Bible, the Sabeans are mentioned in the biblical books of Genesis. First Kings, which includes the account of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. In the book of Isaiah, Job, Ezekiel, and Job also mentions the Sabeans. The latter, or the book of Job, mentions Sabeans as having slain Job's livestock and servants. In the book of Isaiah, they are described as tall of stature. On the left, there's a map. A map of the kingdom of Sabia or the Sabaeans in the 8th century BCE or before Christ's era. So, this is a Associated Press news article dated December 15th, 2023. So, this is last year. How are Houthi slash Sabians events on ships in the Red Sea affecting global trade? So, the Sabians are attempting to close the gate from the south of global world trade, stopping the global trade networks from flowing. London AP, Yemen's or Sabians rebels have escalated events on ships passing through the Red Sea. During the Israel Hamas event, raising concerns about the impact on the flow of oil, grain, and consumer goods through a major global trade artery. Israeli linked vessels have been targeted but the threat to trade has grown as container ships and oil tankers flagged two countries like Norway and Europe and Liberia and Africa have been visited or visited while traversing the waterway between Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. About 10% of the world's trade passes through the Red Sea. These are ancient trade networks. And a sign of widening impact on global trade, after a series of events or near events, this week, Mesrick, the world's biggest shipping company, said Friday that it's told all of its vessels that were due to pass through a maritime choke point in the Southern Red Sea to pause their journey until further notice. If we refer back or a little back to the history of the Sabean Kingdom, or the history of Yemen. There's a map on the left, and it shows the distance between the state of Israel, or the land of Israel Palestine, and the Sabeans. Now here's a bronze man idol or statue found in Al Baida, ancient. Nashkum, in the kingdom of Saba, or the kingdom of the Queen of Sheba, 6th 
the 5th century BCE. The statue could be found in the Lavar Museum in France. So the French historians have some insight, a lot of insight on to the going ons or the historical happenings right now because obviously they have records, physical archaeology of the people of ancient Yemen. And this is from a global perspective. Yemen, country of the biblical Sabaeans. Universal Center for Renovation. What we are trying to do or attempt to do is bring information to the public. We use the King James Version Bible 1611 and the Torah scrolls and other versions of the Bible to highlight or marry history or historical events with modern day current events so we can have a view into the future or to understand future events. So we also bring history into this conversation, sacred history and secular history, global history, rather it's European, African, Asian, Japanese, Indian, Hawaiian, all history plays a part in this story or narrative. Archaeology and anthropology plays a major factor in this narrative because we try to be as fact-based as possible to show that the biblical narrative is not mythology but it's actual history and if it's actual history then the prophetic or prophesized things that are pronounced in the Bible are expected to come to pass because if the history of the Bible is real then the future of the things promised in the Bible should be expected to be just as real as archaeology physical material and this channel centers on the biblical Israelites who they were in ancient times and who they are today and why it matters and what does it mean for the world today? And this picture, image, or icon, this is an Ethiopian icon. And the Sabaeans were Ethiopians. Sabaeans were biblical Kushites. This image of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon shaking hands, an agreement was made. An agreement was acknowledged that King Solomon, the king of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, how King Solomon was fit to have a global world empire rule over other people how he was fit and accepted to be a ruler the top
top ruler of the world in his times. And this is a good time to express the idea that the Sabians, the Kushites of Saudi Arabia, and the Kushites of Africa were the same people. The Kutsites of or Ethiopians of Saudi Arabia intermarried with the Arabs, Shemites of Saudi Arabia. So they have this look. Some look Ethiopian and some have this Arab phenotype or stereotypical Arab phenotype. But they are Kushites. And the Sabians, the Kushites of Saudi Arabia or Yemen, many resemble or have a look that would be described as Arab. The Kushites of Africa have a look that would be described as African, but they are both Kushites. The Queen of Sheba, she was a Kushite from Saudi Arabia, the South, Yemen. But the Sabians also had a territory that extended to Africa or the Kushites of Africa because they were one and the same people. Yemen has existed at the crossroads of its civilizations for more than 7,000 years. The country was home to figures such as the Queen of Sheba, who brought a caravan of gifts for King Solomon. For centuries, it became a primary producer of coffee, exported in the port of Mecca. From its conversion to Islam in the 7th century, Yemen became a center of Islamic learning, and much of its architecture survived until modern times. For example, the Wikipedia article on Yemen can explain this clearly. Yemen, officially the Republic of Yemen, is a country in West Asia. It is located in the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula, bordering Saudi Arabia to the north, and Oman to the northeast, or Oman. It shares maritime borders with Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. In ancient times, Yemen was the home of the Sabians, a trading state that included parts of modern-day Ethiopia and Eritrea. So, the Sabian kingdom existed in Saudi Arabia and also in Ethiopia. Ethiopians are Sabians. Eritrea, the people that live in that country, are also Sabians. Historically, these are Kushites. The Yemeni people or the people of Yemen are Sabians. They are Kushites, but not all Kushites look like your typical Kushites. The Kushites also in ancient times lived in Mesopotamia. Nimrod was a Kushite and he ruled Babylon. The Kushites lived in Babylon, Saudi Arabia, and also Africa beneath Egypt. The Yemeni, the Sabians, are Kushites.
Here's some more evidence or receipts. Wikipedia, Sabians. The Sabians or Sabians were an ancient group of South Arabia or South Arabians. They founded the kingdom of Saba in modern day Yemen, which is considered to be the biblical land of Sheba in the oldest and most important of the South Arabian kingdoms, the kingdom of the Queen of Sheba. And they were Kushites who lived in Saudi Arabia, the southern part, Yemen. Let's turn to the history of King Solomon. Now, some people consider this a scripture or proof of Solomon's color. Some people disagree. But I want to show why it's important to understand that it is a color scripture and it does refer to King Solomon. Not because color is something that people should be obsessed with. This is to show a deeper meaning in one other particular scripture that could be considered a color scripture because the Torah or the Bible was written with many different levels, some literal, some figurative. But we have to understand that there's different layers like layers and an onion to the biblical scriptures. So in this image is called Solomon the Wise. And Solomon is portrayed as a man of color, very dark in appearance. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, we have the English and the Hebrew in this particular version. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon. I'm very dark, but lovely. And this page on the right, the word in Hebrew and the English word is highlighted. Dark. I'm very dark, but lovely. Making reference back to that image of Solomon the Wise. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. Proverb chapter 3 and 13. This is a great precept. And I'm not disputing the fact that it describes a woman from the tribe of Issachar describing her color as dark. No, I'm saying that there's layers to the scriptures. If we go into Jesenius, Hebrew, and Chaldean lexicon of the Old Testament scriptures, I can try to elaborate or explain what I actually mean. In the Hebrew lexicon, we can actually physically say that the word used for black Shikar. Blackish color of the face. And this is referring to the Song of Solomon 1 or chapter 1 verse 5. Blackish color of the face. So in the Hebrew and Chaldee lexicon, to the Old Testament scriptures. The word dark or shakar is translated in different ways. It's used as black here in the book of Leviticus, as horse in the book of Zechariah, but in chapter 1, verse 5 of the Song of Solomon, it means blackish color of the face and why is this important to verify these words in their meaning because the scriptures have different layers 
And this is important to understand what's happening in Yemen today to understand these different layers and I'm going to refer to or we're going to go to Dr. William Smith Dictionary of the Bible to really bring this point across before I go into the William Smith Bible Dictionary I would like to explain what I am attempting to do which is explain the empire or the governmental or the government structure of the empire underneath David and Solomon. Because this scripture is highlighting or explaining that, but it's doing multiple things at the same time. So highlighting a part of the scripture which is jeremiah 14 2 they are black onto the ground some people see this as a script a color scripture as i do but it also has different levels and different layers some people reject this as a color scripture describing the complexion of the children of israel but when you take the scripture out of that meaning of this is the children of israel this is their complexion this is their color they're the children of adam from the earth from the dust but also it's explaining more let me try to elaborate more they are black onto the ground jeremiah 14 and 2 the children of israel they are black onto the ground does it really means black. They are black onto the ground. Does it mean dark? Does it mean something much more complex? There's an image of King David from Dura Europis. On the left. And on the right is an icon of King Solomon. Who is described as black and comely or dark and lovely. Now the phrase... They are black. It's from the Hebrew word, Kadar. And the next phrase, onto the ground, Eretz. Earth, soil, ground. Eretz. So, King David, King Solomon. They are black onto the ground. One is dark brown. One is a yellowish color how can they are black to the ground describe both these men and king david was the father of king solomon so is this a color scripture or isn't it can this scripture describe both men king david king solomon who seem to have been different skin tones Let's find out. So we have the word Kodar. And we have the word Eretz or Aratiza, Earth. So let's marry these words to understand this phrase. They are black unto the ground. Kodar Eretz or Kodar Aratiza, depending on what dialect of Hebrew you are using. Kudar, Aretz, or Aratiza, Proto Hebrew, Ancient Hebrew. And this image or icon of or fresco painting of Samuel anointing King David is from the oldest synagogue in the world, Dera Europus. The oldest synagogue in the world is located in Dera Europis, Syria. Wall painting of David, anointed king of Israel by the prophet Samuel. Okay, I would like to give some meaning to that piece of archaeology, that 
piece of physical evidence of King David. And this is from the complete works of Josephus, of Flavius Josephus. Uh, he was a, a Levite. He was a general in the war of Israel against the Romans. He was captured by the Romans. And later he wrote a history of the Israelites. And his works, he describes King David. The physical appearance of King David from 1 Samuel 16 or chapter 16 verse 11 to 13 and this is biblical history it could be considered a secular historical account it's from antiquities of the jews book 6 chapter 8 josephus now as soon as his father has sent for david and he was come he appeared king david he appeared to be of a yellow complexion of a sharp sight and comely person in other respects also so here we have an historical account of king david of having a yellow or basically a light brown complexion or ruddy as he's called in the scripture or in modern day times people are called yellow or red bone so he had a light brown complexion or red bone or yellow complexion and king david his son king solomon was not described as light brown but in the song of solomon king james version one in five he's described as i am black but comely oh ye daughters of Jerusalem as the tents of Kedar as the curtains of Solomon and this is a play on words as the tents of Kedar Kedar is the name of one of the tribes of Ishmael or one of his sons Kedar so I'm black the tents of Kadar. Black in this verse is Kadar. Kadar has another meaning besides just the name of a man being named Kadar, one of the sons of Ishmael or the Arabs. So there's different layers to this. I'm black, like Kadar. What does Kadar mean? Kadar with a qua sound. Qua, Kadar. So what does Kadar mean? Kadar. The King James translation strongs H6937 in the following manner. I must skip to the point. Kadar. Kodar means black, dark, blackish, darkened. Kodar, black, dark, blackish, darkened. The name of Ishmael's son Kodar means dark. Solomon, reiterating the point that he's black but comely, like Kodar. Kodar meaning black, dark, blackish, dark ended. This information is from the Blue Letter Bible, so you can look this up. Outline of biblical use of the word Kodar. A. To be dark. Strong definition. Kodar. Dark colored. Blackish, darken, quadar. Now we can go to the Dr. William Smith's Dictionary of the Bible and look up the word quadar. Black skin, 
black skinned man. So that's a clear definition of what the word Kadar means. And in the Hebrew verse where King Solomon is described, I am black but comely, the Hebrew word Kadar is used. And it means black skin, black skinned man. And the word being used to describe the complexion of King Solomon is interesting because Kadar is also the name of a man whose name is Kadar. And the meaning of that word is black skin, black skinned man. And Kadar was a son of Ishmael, a father of one of the Arab tribes. So this is not only describing King Solomon, but it's describing a tribe of Arabs, of Ishmael, lights, of Arabs, being considered black skin or black skin man. So as we can see, this verse, Jeremiah 14, 2, is about complexion and color, but it's also about the government of the nation of Israel because the Israelite records, the text is written with many layers. It's really is a work of art. Jeremiah 14 2 Judah mourned in the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. So on one layer, the literal layer, the historical layer, you can see where, okay, Judah is in mourning. And the gates they have languished. They are black unto the ground. So the gates of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem was burnt down. And the gates are black because the Babylonians and the Edomites raised the city of Jerusalem to the ground. So the gates are black because of fire. On the other layer, another layer, figurative layer of this verse, Judah mourneth. The people of Judah were in mourning and the gates there of languish. So, is this more than just the Babylonians burning down the city of Jerusalem and the gates are blackened because of the fire that was destroyed the city, ravaged the city, and turned the gates black? Yes, because the Near East had figurative language. And this scripture is an example of how language was used to express complex ideas. The Hebrew language is beautiful. Judah mourned, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. Okay, so let's look into the usage of poetic language. Obviously, King David and King Solomon both are Israelites, and they are described as black unto the ground. Literally, that seems to only apply to King Solomon, who des describes himself as black but comely, and King David, who is described as ruddy or of a yellow complexion, wouldn't necessarily fit into the idea of being black or is this I'm black but comely and King David being ruddy or yellow so they're black into the ground how does that fit without any contradictions the phrase quadar they are black with the phrase arrest or Eretz, or Aratiza. They are black unto the ground. They are black like the ground. They are black like the ground. Let's 
really look at this statement. In the verse, Jeremiah 14, 2, they are black unto the ground, is an analogy. It's a comparison. Comparing the different type of ranges of color of the soil in comparison with the diversity of the children of Israel. This article might shed some light on the color of soil or earth, Eretz, or in the ancient Hebrew, Aratiza, earth. The diversity and the color of earth compared to the diversity and the color of the children of Israel. Relationship between soil, color, and climate. What is the first color? that comes to mind when you envision soil. Is it brown, black, yellow, or red? How about white, gray, green, or blue? Any of these answers are correct, depending on where you are from. It is true, soils come in an incredible range of colors. And this is also correct for the children of Israel. The children of Israel, they come in an incredible range of colors. So Jeremiah 14, 2, they are black unto the ground. They are dark or black unto the earth, the soil. The children of Israel they have all varieties of skin types, like the different colors of the earth. As we can clearly see in this image, soil or earth isn't just one color. It's different shades of brown, from chocolate brown to light brown, and also you have a sort of vanilla chocolate. So we can see that soil is diverse. And this comparison of the different colors of earth with the different colors of the children of Israel is an analogy. It's a comparison. That analogy was perfect. When comparing human variation and color, typically the children of Israel in the different ranges of color that they appear to represent. If we go to the country Brazil and South America, this might highlight why this comparison was perfect. This is a crowd, a Brazilian crowd. And this image from this one country, Brazil, you can see many ranges of color from dark brown to light brown to beige, white chocolate, all the different variations of skin complexion and color. If we take these soil samples and compare them with the faces in the crowd, the Brazilian crowd, then that analogy makes sense. The different soil samples, different samples of brown, beige, just different ranges of color. If you compare it with the Brazilian crowd, it's a pretty accurate analogy. Brazil, 
officially the Federated Republic of Brazil. It is the largest country in South America and in Latin America. Brazil is the world's fifth largest country by area and the seventh most populous. It is one of the most multicultural and ethnically diverse nations. Due to over a century of mass immigration from around the world. This article is very interesting because it gives insight into how Brazilians view themselves. Like the synagogue at Dere Europus, where the Jews or the Israelites at that time drew or painted themselves 136 variations of Brazilian skin colors Rio de Janeiro AP or Associated Press 136 variations of Brazilian skin colors when asked to describe their skin color Brazilians came up with 136 variations not just black and white when Brazilians were given a chance to describe their skin color, they came up with 136 shades and variations. The survey was done in 1976 by the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics and was published again in a 2011 congressional document titled the Constitutional Commission on Justice and Citizenship. The list illustrates how Brazilians see themselves a far more complex color system than simply black or white. I won't read the Portuguese. I will only read the highlighted yellow in English. You can read it for yourself. It's online. But let me begin with the variations. I'm not going to go through the whole list. Just a portion of the list. Somewhat chestnut colored. Snowy white. Dark snowy white. Pinkish white. Yellow yellowish burnt yellow somewhat dark skinned reddish blue very white very white very pale very dark skinned white going for red honey colored white white but Dark skinned, freckled white, off white, dark chestnut, chocolate colored, light colored, pale, copper colored, coffee colored, gourd colored, milk colored, milk white, gold colored, golden. Bronze colored, sun tanned, whitening, dark, very dark, having fiery colored hair, Galatian or Portuguese, light skin, the color of a type of apple, orange, lilac, blonde, light blonde, pink, creole, Brown, half yellow, half white, half dark skinned, half black, honey colored, half cast mastiza, miscegenation, mixed, dark skinned, brunette, sunburnt marina, somewhat cinnamon colored marina, chestnut colored marina, light. Skinned Marina, Cinnamon Colored Marina, 
somewhat Molina, dark Molina, dark complexioned man. Dark complexioned man, dark Molina, purplish Molina, red headed Molina, swarthy, dusky Molina, mulatto girl, little mulatto girl, negress, young negress. Not very light, not very dark complexioned, somewhat toward white, almost negro, sunburnt, beach sunburnt, deep dyed, very dark, brown, light brown, black brown, deep dyed, very dark, rose colored. Or the rose itself, rosy, sunburnt rosy, yellow haired negro, toasted. Now we can understand why the analogy or the comparison with the earth was ingenious. It's a universal comparison. Simply, it's something everyone can understand to describe variations in color. It's like, look, they are dark or black to the ground. Understanding this, that the soil or the earth comes in many different variations. They are as diverse as the colors of the earth. They are black onto the earth. They are dark onto the earth. They are different shades of brown like the earth. It's a universal idea that everyone can understand. So it's an unbiased point of view. They are black onto the ground. Once we understand the soil comes in many different types. The soil layers have many different colors. So Jeremiah 14.2 is a color scripture, but it's more. It's comparing the Israelites' diversity. As you can see in the picture on the left, these are all images from the synagogue Dera Europis. It's around 2,000 years old, and it's how the Jews or the Israelites themselves painted themselves different variations. If you compare it to the crowd, the Brazilian crowd, you can see 2,000 years ago, the Israelites were a very diverse nation or group of people because at this time, only three tribes was in a land of Israel, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. So when compared with the other tribes, the 10 tribes, Ephraim, Issachar, Manasseh, Asher, you can understand that this ethnic group, Israel, was a very diverse people. And this diversity help the Israelites because in the time of David, King David and King Solomon, Israel was a global power. With King Solomon's navy, the Israelites were selling to the Americas. And also they were selling to the Far East as far as the South China Sea. So India, Malaysia, the Pacific, ocean the israelites blended in with the other nations that they traveled among so this diversity helped the israelites rule their empire also the israelites were in europe in ancient greece italy the Israelites went to Britain at the time of Solomon to get tin. 
So they were also in the Baltic, in Northern Europe, in Germany. They were in North Africa. They were in West Africa. They sailed the world in the time of King Solomon. The Israelites were a sea power. You can compare them to what Great Britain was in its heyday. So let's investigate Jeremiah 14 too, a little more. Judah, the tribe of Judah, which includes Benjamin and Levi, mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is going up. During the time of Jeremiah, this is the time of the Babylonian captivity. So the tribe of Judah, Benjamin and Levi, Judah, the Jews, they were mourning because their government was destroyed by the Babylonians. So the Jews at this time was mourning because in the time of Solomon, they had an empire, but now they were in captivity. In the gates thereof language, they are black unto the ground. We studied the black unto the ground, the diversity of the Israelites. But this verse is complex, but simple. Judah mourning. Judah is in mourning because they're not in an exalted position anymore. Under Solomon and David, they were in an exalted position, world governance. But now they are subjected people. And the gates thereof languish. The gates. Now we're going to investigate the term the gates. Universal center, we try to be as historically accurate as possible. So, to explain the term gates, we have to have a picture of an ancient city to understand what the gates represented to the ancient Israelites. So, here's a Bible dictionary. Who's in the Bible, the Old Testament and the Apocrypha, and the New Testament. In this volume, there is a reconstruction. That's on the right, a picture. A reconstruction of the city Megiddo as it was at the time of King Solomon. If we go back to Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 2, and read it again. Judah, the Jews mourned. Judah mourned in the gates thereof languish. In ancient times, ancient cities had walls that surrounded the city. The only way in and out of the cities were through these fortified gates. So in ancient times, when a city was attacked by an, by an army, the army on the outside would try to breach the city walls by knocking them down or climbing over the walls or knock down the gates of the city so they can get entry into the city and attack the citizens that lived inside the cities. So the gates were important to ancient cities and the people that lived inside. So gates were so important that they use the term gate as a comparison, as an analogy for protection. And who protected the people? The government. So the term gates and government became synonymous. And the fact that the government buildings and offices of or departments of government usually were situated near the gates of the city. This phrase, and the gates thereof, the phrase and the gates thereof, or the word gates, have two meanings. One, the literal, which is the actual gates. And the second 
fricative. The fricative or symbolic meaning of gates. And that is central government or government of the city. If you turn to the Blue Letter Bible and look up the translation of the word gate in its Hebrew form, Sha'ar, gate. Now, it has different meanings. Gate, city, door, or port, or porters. So, the word gate also means port. Gate means port. The Strong's definition for gate in the Hebrew, Sha'ar, in its original sense, an opening, door, or gate, or a port. In this Wikipedia article, it will explain how the term gate and port was Middle Eastern slang for central government. So, the gates thereof, gates meaning central government. So, let's read the article. Sublime port. This is a slang term or a figure of speech term. The sublime port also known as the Ottoman port or high port. Um, the Ottoman Turkish language, it would be pronounced Bab I Ali. Bab literally means gate and Ali high was a synacrochi or a metaphor used to refer collectively to the central government. So the term port, gate, it's a term that, or metaphor, to refer to the central government. So saying or using the term gate means central government. The name has its origin in the old practice in which the ruler announced his official decisions and judgments at the gate of his palace. This was the practice in the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire used the term port or gate to refer to central government. And it was also adopted by the Ottoman Turk sultans. The palace of the sultan or the high gate leading to it. So high gate or gate means central government. The gate now known as the imperial gate. So high gate or another way to refer to this high gate or central government is the sublime port. So gate means port, central government. So this is a picture of the Ottoman high gate or central government. When you go through these gates, you will head either to the king's palace or the other departments of state. Or the treasury. This is where you actually enter to enter the official buildings of the central government. So gate and central government is synonymous. It's used in the same way as over here in America, we say Capitol Hill. In the Near East, the term was used as gate, meaning central government. Another image of the high gate or central government, the gates there of language or the Israelites central government was in ruins when their enemies, whether it was the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks or the Romans, destroyed their gate, their central government. Another image of the high gate or central government. Once you enter into these gates, you have the Department of Defense, the Secretary of the Treasury or the, the King. This is where the judgments were made, important 
and judgment, the gate, the central government. We try to bring as many proofs or receipts as possible to make this narrative, this biblical narrative as historically concrete as possible. So here's Collins Atlas of the Bible. Inside, you can find an image or picture of a reconstruction artist rendering of Solomonic Jerusalem or Jerusalem during the time of King Solomon. Around the time 970 to 931 BCE. Around the time of King Solomon. And here we have another painting of Solomonic Jerusalem or the city of Jerusalem at the time of King Solomon. The highest place of the city, there stood the temple, the first temple of Jerusalem it was in the highest locale, highest position in the city. And it's important to emphasize that King Solomon's navy sailed around the world. Inside this book, this of the Bible, there's navy routes that King Solomon Navy took to sail in the Mediterranean. And if you Look closely at the blue lines. They went to Greece, Italy, the islands of the Mediterranean like Sicily, Corsica. They went to Spain. And from Spain, they went north to Britain and south to West Africa. The blue line. With the red line, you can see they went to the bottom of Saudi Arabia. Yemen, and they also went to Egypt and into Kush or Nubia. Also, the Red Sea Blue Line route or trade route shows that they actually rounded Africa or the Horn of Africa to go down into South Africa. And also, they diverged from the Blue Line at the bottom of Saudi Arabia and went into the area of the Indian Ocean and beyond. King Solomon's navy also left the Mediterranean, sailed into the Atlantic Ocean, and sailed to a place known as Ophir, which is known today as the Americas. Before 1492, and the transatlantic slave trade. If you live in Europe, Africa, and Asia, including the South Pacific, the tribes that you will most likely be descended from are Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. There are exceptions, but Judah, Benjamin, and Levi were the tribes of Israel that was scattered in Europe, Africa, and Asia before the transatlantic slave trade. After the transatlantic slave trade, the Judites, Benjamites, and Levites that lived in West Africa, that lived in Spain and Portugal, was moved to the Americas. But the tribes were scattered. So there are Israelites in Europe, Africa, and Asia, and the South Pacific, people who don't know their descendants of the tribes of Israel, but they will most likely be Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Solomon had a global empire, so Israelites were traveling around the world in his days. 
So some of the early kings of Europe were said to be able to trace their lineage to the tribe of Judah. Some historians think groups like the Celts were traceable to the tribe of Levi. There are records to show Israelite migrations to India, to China, Japan, to Australia, where they intermarried with other groups. So they're not, or they're most likely not, and then know that they're Israelites. And the diversity of complexion and phenotypes is not an issue because Israelites are a people that have variations in physical types. And also prior to 1492 and Columbus discovery of the Americas, the Northern Kingdom of Israel lived throughout North, Central, South America and the Caribbean. They were called the Indians of the Americas. And there's historical proof to show that these people who Columbus met were the biblical lost tribes of Israel. So on this side, the Western Hemisphere, if you was indigenous of this land, then you would be a descendant of the northern tribes of Israel. In previous videos, there were historical proofs that highlighted the fact that the Israelites in the Western Hemisphere were called Western Ethiopians. And they were the ten tribes. And in the old world, the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, or the Jews, were called Eastern Ethiopians. Collectively, they were the Israelites in the Americas and Jerusalem. The 12 tribes of Israel was descended from a man called Jacob, who named later was changed to Israel. His father was named Isaac, and his father was named Abraham. All the tribes, all the 12 tribes of Israel, all the Israelites were descended from one man called Jacob. Also, his name was changed to Israel. But Jacob had four wives, Leah, Zilpah, Bilhah, and Rachel. So the diversity in the tribes could be accounted for by the fact that all the tribes descended from different women. Some tribes descended from the same mother, but there was four women who were the wives of Jacob. So the diversity in the tribes were there from the beginning. So this story of the 12 tribes of Israel and their connection with a global world empire that involved the queen of Sheba and the Sabaeans will be continued.